Hi again, guys. I wanted to jump on here for all of you who are card collectors, uh, but don't have vintage and want to get into it, or if you used to collect, don't have your cards anymore, and you want to start a vintage collection now, I wanted to go over a few things. Nietzsche said, one cannot fly into flying, so you have to start somewhere. You know, I was at, um, so when Facebook came out, I uh, started a, a page for my collection to show my cards and everything. And I guess all my friends can see when I, when I post. Uh, so I was at happy hour with a friend of mine and, uh, you know, he made his comment, a grown man collecting baseball cards, you know. Um, but, I mean, look at the prices these cards are selling for. Yeah, there are some grown men there. <laughs> So there are a lot of us. Don't ever let anybody put you down for collecting baseball cards. It's a great hobby. I mean, there have been lots of famous people that collected them. Charlie Sheen. I remember seeing a special with um, um, DiCaprio, and he was showing his baseball cards when he was younger. Uh, Keith Olbermann has one of the best collections in the country, um, in the world. And, I mean, I collect baseball cards, and look how cool I am. Come on. So I wanted to just give you some pointers and tips and maybe where to begin. Um, one of the best ways to begin if you want vintage uh, cards of the great players during their playing career, their playing time, are these cards. We have the 1913 National Game. These were kind of game cards issued like uh, playing cards. And you could pick these up a lot more affordably than you can some of the other more um, popular sets. but. All the great players are represented here. And then this is the 1914 Polo Grounds game. They're very similar, uh, but two different sets, as you can see. But these are very collectible and um, relatively affordable for old, you know, great players during their playing times. Now, if you want vintage cards um, and you don't mind if it's maybe a little after their playing time or whatever, there are a few options, too. One is a 1960 Fleer set. And you can routinely find these autographed um, for like in the $30 range. Um, you know, some of them a little more, but they're, they're very affordable. So the 61 Fleer is a really nice and one of my favorite all-time sets. And the 62 Fleer. You can routinely find these autographed as well, some of the old players. A lot of people got these graded back in the 60s and 70s and 80s when these players were, you know, still alive. And... Um, it's a, it's a, they're great sets. Another one is the 61 Golden. These came in a, a book, and you they were perforated, and you cut them out. Uh, you can still find the complete sheets. This is a nice another nice set to collect of the all-time greats. <clears throat> now, the difference between vintage and new is... One of the differences, obviously, is that, uh, you know, vintage cards became rare organically. Um, where the new cards are made to be rare in the pack. So they will issue uh, refractors, parallels, numbered cards, rookie cards, things like that. Those are what we call hits. There's memor memorabilia, autographed. So they call those hits. A lot of collectors, and maybe even most collectors today, will look for the hits and throw the other cards away or try to sell them or complete a set and sell them, that kind of thing. Um, whereas with vintage, I mean, even some of the commons are worth a lot of money if they're more scarce. For instance, Topps issued a lot of third series in their sets. And those third series sets were kind of when football season was starting and kids had to choose between buying football cards or baseball cards. And since it was football season, they would generally buy the football cards. So not as many kids bought the third series. And a lot of those high numbers, even players that, you know, weren't very good, can sell for a little bit more money because of that scarcity and for people that are looking to complete those sets. The set collector also is much bigger in vintage than in modern cards. Um, you know, it's really difficult to complete these sets with the short prints and the parallels and then what, what actually constitutes a complete set. Do you need every memorabilia card that was issued? Do you need every autograph card that was issued? So set collecting is much more, you know, popular amongst um, vintage collectors. Second thing is, obviously for the top dollar and those auction prices you saw, those are the top graded cards. When it comes to vintage, don't, you know, you don't have to be so particular about grade. Um, you will find beat up Ty Cobbs and Bay Ruth that still sell for over $1,000, sometimes even more. 
um, and a rare card too. Sometimes you can only find it in a one or a two, and that's okay. Um, vintage is a little less about the grade unless you are an investor in the cards. So if you're a collector, don't mind the lower grades. In fact, I buy all my cards based on looks. Uh, I have seen, you know, threes and fours and fives that don't look as good as some twos. And that's okay. Like, I buy uh, based on looks. So let me give you some examples. I mean, here's a Honus Wagner card that I have that's graded a 1.5. Fair. I mean, look how gorgeous this is. I have yet to find a three that looks this good. Here's a um, Ted Williams. That's a 2.5. I can't find a thing wrong with it. And again, I mean, I see fives that aren't this nice. And you can pick these up a lot more reasonably priced. Here's a Sandy Koufax Rookie. I'm going to just look at the eye appeal on that. And when I buy cards, especially vintage cards, I am more concerned about the image quality than I am about the corners. Because a lot of vintage um, cards have surface flaws or surface wear. And, you know, a card is less desirable to me if it has a crease right through a main area of the card or it has a print imperfection or, you know, a gum stain or something there that takes away from the eye appeal of the card. So I suggest that you buy your cards based on eye appeal and not the technical grade. You know, when um, grading companies issue a grade, it's a technical grade. So it, they look at the surface, the corners, how sharp they are, if there are any print defects, that kind of thing. They actually don't take the look of the card into account too much. So you're getting a technical grade. For instance, if this had a little pinhole, it would automatically be a fair report based on their technical grading scale. And a lot of the things they find, like with this Ted Williams, for instance, I mean, maybe they found something under a microscope, some indent or imperfection to warrant this 2.5 grade. But I can't see it with the naked eye. I put it under light, uh, microscope, wear my reading glasses. I, I don't see anything wrong with the card. Um, so anyway, that's my suggestion. Um, Another uh, vintage great set, if you want, uh, and I just love these cards, is the uh, 63 Bazooka cards. And, uh, you know, they look vintage. Um, they're really great cards. And these aren't, you know, quite as easy to find as some of the other greats cards. They made two versions of these. And until, you know, recent years, I didn't even realize there was a second version. But they make them in a gold, and they make them in a silver. And the silver is actually way more rare. Um, so if you can get your hands on the silver, that's probably preferable from a future selling standpoint. Here's another example of a great low-grade card with beautiful eye appeal. Now this is a, you know this is a rare set and this is a highly desired card. Here it is in a two. I can't find a thing wrong with it. There's no creasing that I can find. It's ju it just presents beautifully. It's beautifully centered, which these can be very off-centered. So. Um, now, if you want to go um, more, a little bit more modern and get some of the great players, some of the things you can do is Topps issued supersets over the years. These are larger cards, and they sell for next to nothing usually. Um, and they're great. They're a great set. But for whatever, whatever reason, these cards they consider oddball, which on a previous video I mentioned that I don't like that term because a card is a card. And, but these are very um, affordable to pick up. And also, um, and I just did a video on this, the 1964 Topps Giants set. You know, it has most of the Hall of Famers from that era. And uh, they're beautiful cards. So that's one way to go. And the other thing I wanted to tell you that is if you want to collect um, the vintage cards from their playing days, one of the most popular sets is the T206. It may be the most popular set. And if you want your cards to retain value and so forth, there are a lot of collectors that collect this set. And some people only collect this set. Um, T206 collectors are very passionate, and they try to complete the set. There's all kind of different backs on them. And so if you, if you're, if you don't care about backs, you can go with the Piedmont or the Sweet Capital and, and the more modern backs, and you can get them a little bit less priced. And a lot of the um, lesser players or, you know, the good players that aren't in the Hall of Fame, uh, you can pick them up very uh, affordably these days. Uh, so most people complete, consider this set complete without the rare Honus Wagner, the Sherry McGee error, and the Eddie Plank. 
which the Eddie Plank card is actually probably, um, it's my understanding, more rare than the Honus Wagner. Um, so, you know, those are generally unattainable for most people, so they, comp they consider the complete set without those cards. Other more modern um, vintage cards that you can collect pretty affordably is the Kellogg sets, these 3D cards. I mean, I love these. You know, I pulled them out of Kellogg's boxes. Uh, they have a special place in my heart. And the Hostess. I cut these out of uh, Ho-Hos and Twinkies. Uh, these are all very affordable vintage cards if you want, you know, a starting point and you don't have a lot of money. Next, let's talk about where you can find information on vintage cards. First, as I showed you in, in here uh, with the auction prices, you have the Beckett Vintage Collector magazine that comes out every other month. You have the Sports Collector's Digest that comes out every other week. And they routinely feature sets. Um, they interview people that have put the set together, tell you the most difficult cards to find in that set, and tell you what you can expect to pay and show you some recent auction prices. And then, of course, my Bible for card collecting is the standard catalog of vintage baseball cards. They also make one for football. Um, <clears throat> this just has every vintage card issue that they know of. And it's checklisted. It tells you a little bit about the cards. And I'll just routinely read through here to educate myself on different card issues. Although that's a bad habit to get into because when you discover a new one, you want to go out and you know jump on eBay and see what I can find. It could be a bad habit <laughs> and you could spend too much money. The other thing I wanted to talk about is how to store your cards, right? So one thing that, one thing that you'll find and a lot of people in the old days used to use just because they look so fantastic are these acrylic cubes. I do not recommend using these for your cards because they can damage them. I do love the way they look and I will use them for things like stamps and very thin cards that can't really be damaged. And I put a protector on there uh, in between. But I would not recommend using these. They, they flatten the card, and if you ever get it graded, it could actually damage the card. So, we have um, these semi-rigids, and there's two different sizes here. Um, this larger size is used for the larger size cards, of course, but it's also the preferred method if you ever send a card in for grading. Now, I don't like to touch my cards too often. When I get them, they stay in that condition, period. Uh, so storing them in these is not a bad way to go if you ever plan on sending them in for grading because they'll already be there. You don't have to transfer them. Uh, what most people do is they like to do the, um, the top loaders, right? And these are cheap and easy, easy to obtain. You can get them at Walmart or Target or lots of other places, Hobby Lobby, and they get a soft sleeve. So you put the card in the soft sleeve and then in the top loader. And what a lot of guys will do is they'll take a razor blade or a box cutter or a little real sharp knife and they'll cut the edges. That way when you put the vintage card in there, uh, you don't have any chance of damaging the corners, which is possible if you just put them in the regular top loader. That's another reason I don't use these. Um, and also if you ever take it out of here to send it for grading or want to transfer it, you, you, have it, you, know, you kind of have to push it from the bottom and you can damage the card taking it out of a... I mean, that doesn't happen often, I, I, but I just don't like touching a card like that. So, that's it for... Uh, oh, the one last thing I wanted to talk to you about is how to store your cards. And I like to use BCW Supplies, and they make these boxes. This is called a, a vault. And this is for graded cards. So this is a graded card vault. They make one for regular size cards too if you don't have graded cards. So um, these come flat and you put them together and they store cards really nicely. And I have a whole bunch of pencils that I keep around and I will write on here what the set is. And you can easily erase it if you ever transfer from this because they also make shoebox size. So if you have more cards than this, you can buy the shoe boxes. So as I add the sets and I pack this up, I will uh, take them from here and put them into a graded shoe box. And then I can easily erase um, the set name and uh, you know put a different set in here. And they also sell these monster pads, they're called. And you can, you can see you're gonna have a gap, right? And 
<clears throat> so you can use these monster pads and you put them in here and it stops the cards from <laughs> moving around if you put it in there properly. <laughs> So those are real cheap. You can get a big, long <clears throat> package of them for, I don't know, 10 bucks or something. Uh, but, you know, it's a good, good little investment to keep all your cards from moving around or possibly getting bent or anything like that. So that's it for now. Hey, thanks for watching.